started. <laughs> Om. 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 Sahana Bhavatu. Sahana Bhunaktu. Sahabiryam Karavavahai. Tejas Vinavati Tamas Tumavit Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Om Parthaya Pratibhotitam Bhagavatam Narayane na svayam, Yase na kratitam, Purana muninam, Madhe mahabharatam, Atvaitam dritavarshinim, Bhagavatim, Ashta dashadhyainim, Ambatva manusantatami, Bhagavad gite bhavat veshinim. Namostute vyasa vishana buddhe Kulla ravinda yata patra netra Yena tvaya bharata taila purnaha Prajwani tognana maya pradipaha Prapanna pari jataya Totra vetraika panaye Nyana mudraya krishnaya Gitaam rudadu he namaha. Mukham karoti vachanam. One second. Mukham karoti vachanam. Pangum langayate girim. Yat kripa tamaham vande. Paramananda madavam. Yam brahma varunendra rutra marutaha. Stunvanti divyai stavaihi, Vedai sanga padakramo panishadaihi, Gayanti yam samaga, Dhyana vastita dat katena manasa, Pashyanti yam yoginaha, Yasyantam navidu sura suraganaha, Deva yatasmai namaha, Deva yatasmai namaha. Sarvatharman parityajya, mame kam sharanam braja, aham twa sarva pape bhyaha, moksha yishyami ma shuchaha. So we are in the eighth chapter. This chapter is called as Akshara Brahma Yoga, indicating that as much as in the seventh chapter, we actually studied about. Um, the world and how the whole world is nothing but Ishwara. In the eighth chapter, we are actually going inwards. So in the seventh chapter, we saw that certain terms were used in the beginning. And then in the beginning also, we learned about this, where, you know, Arjuna wanted to know the meaning of all those terms like Adhyatma, Brahma, and then uh, Adi Yajna, Karma. So we saw all this. Now, the reason for asking the question is, again, in the seventh chapter, we learned a lot about that the world is outside us. But in the eighth chapter, we are trying to understand that the whole world, which is nothing but Ishwara, is not just outside, but it is also inside. So we cannot really limit what we call as Ishwara or God to something that is only outside and it permeates the whole world and everything. It is not, it is not exactly that, right? So like in Isha Vasya Upanishad, you know, we have Isha Vasya Idagam Sarvam. So in that also, you know, it says God pervades all things. So when we think about this pervasive nature of God in all things, we are kind of likely to commit this mistake that all things means only things that we see through our eyes. And this seeing through our eyes can be very, very limiting, you know. So it's kind of an error really in our concept because 
we ourselves, you know, we think okay, we we never can realize that we are also one of the things of the world. So, as since we are also one of the things of the world, obviously that God has to be inside also. So this adibhuta, which was a word that was used, adibhuta prapancha, which is really uh, externally, which is what we think is the external world. That should not be taken as just the world in which God dwells, but God also dwells in the Adhyatma Purusha. I'm sorry, Adhyatma Prapancha. So Prapancha meaning the whole uh, pervasive world. So that is also nothing but that Ishwara. So this, you know, like for example, when I see this picture of somebody sitting on the chair, I look at, you know, somebody that, okay, somebody is outside me. You know, but normally this thought, you know, but we never really think normally that, no, it is also me who is sitting in the form of that lady outside. So we always look at outside, we always judge things outside. But more and more, we have to start thinking about that, you know, that what I see outside is also within me. So in other words, Whatever we see, which is outside in the form of the chair, in the form of the lady, in the form of all those pictures, is actually nothing but me, which is also existing in everything else. So that's the part that eighth chapter is slowly and slowly bringing us to it. That in seventh chapter, we saw everything which was outside and we were able to uh, appreciate and understand that whole prapancha there is nothing but Ishwara in different forms and everything. But in this, we are also part of that Ishwara. I am also in that lady. I am in that chair. I am in that carpet. I am in this. Everything is nothing but me alone. So that's the part is a chapter. So I just wanted to give a little bit of introduction. We'll just chant shlokas one through five and then we'll move on to uh, almost eighth, no, tenth, eight to tenth. We will spend a little more because last time that's where we stopped. Arjuna uvacha kim tad brahma kim adhyatmam kim karma purushottama adhibhutam cha kim proktam adhidaivam kim muchyate adhiyagnyakatam kotra dehesmin madhusudana Rayana Kale Chakatham Neyo Siniyatatma Bhihi Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Aksharam Brahma Paramam Swabhavo Dhyatma Uchyate Bhuta Bhavo Dhava Karaha Visarka Karma Sangitaha Adhiputam Ksharo Bhavaha Purushashchadi daivatam adhiyagnyoha me vatra dehe deha pratambara. So we saw all these terms in all these four shlokas, but the whole idea is the key point that everything at the end of the day is nothing but Ishvara. So starting with everything which is we said out, outside, which is adhibhuta. Uh, then we talked about karma, which is the process, which is part of this creation. Adhidaiva, which is the Hiranyagarbha, or the totality of the subtle minds. Adhyatma, which is uh, that uh, uh, Akshara Brahma, which is outside, which we think is outside, is actually nothing but everywhere. It is Adhyatma, which is within myself also. So this is all the things that we discussed about. And then the question that Arjuna asked, after all these technical questions, probably one of the most powerful questions for us where we are, which is then how do I really attain that Ishwara when I'm close to the point of giving up this clothing, which is this body? What? How can I really attain this one? So that's kind of a definite action that uh, Arjuna is asking Krishna, you know, what is that action I have to do? So then Krishna says, well, the only thing you have to do is just remember Ishvara. Just remember Ishvara all the time. So, you know, sounds pretty straightforward here. You know, I mean, 
from this narrative that I gave just now, if everything else is Ishwara outside, and if I'm also Ishwara, then it's no brainer, you know, I will only think about Ishwara, right? Quite straightforward. But we know it is not the case. We know that even as we are nearing, I mean, if I say nearing towards the end of my life sounds very, uh, you know, uh, depressing. But, you know, we have to be mindful of the fact that we have no idea when our uh, uh, time of leaving, of giving up this body is going to come, just like we never knew when we were going to be born, right? That was not in our hands. And these two things are probably the things which is not in our hands. So I need to start thinking about that Ishvara. And that is why Bhagavad Gita, you know, is giving us all that uh, technical information as well as logical information about really this ultimate goal in my life. So this example that I have, which I've shown here with the mother, you know, um, one second. Where is my mother's picture here? Oh, this my thing is hiding here. So the ultimately the idea is where uh, the only way, just like a mother, you know, thinks about when she has a baby, her mind is totally tuned to the baby, right? In every possible way. Can we use that same kind of an example to our minds that slowly and slowly, when I am looking at something else, I think that that is nothing but Ishwara in the form of my phone, Ishwara in the form of the person, Ishwara in the form of this. You know, everything I just substitute with Ishwara. Once I do that, that by itself becomes a kind of um, a meditation, you know. So that meditation is the only way that I can start to slowly dissolve all these aspects you know, Adhyatma, Adhideva, Adhibhuta, Karma, Adhideva, all these things, I dissolve into this one aspect that ultimately it is nothing but Ishvara. When I do that, then I will only focus when I'm doing something which is consistent with what the skills I have and what my role is in the society. So I will focus only on improving my skills improving on my duty itself. And when I do that, but keeping in mind the power that ultimately everything is Ishwara. It's like this example of, you know, in a concert where we have, uh, or uh, not just a concert, even an orchestra, right? How is it that we are able to find that peace when I go to a concert, when I go to the most beautiful concert, I come out and say, oh my God, that was just so beautiful. The only way that that happens is when I recognize that every one, every aspect in that orchestra, you know, that may be a 50 person orchestra with all the instruments, but they all are in sync. They are all in harmony. They're all in harmony with a particular pitch or in Tamil, in, uh, in the Indian language, you would say Shruti, right? At the end of the day, the, even when somebody is, um, you know, in a concert and there's silence, there is a Shruti which goes on, right? So that Shruti is like this Ishwara, you know? So when I have the Shruti in my background, then automatically, uh, and I just perform to the best I can, consistent with my skills, consistent with really what my role is, then that itself is a great meditation. So that is where we talked about. Any questions before we go into this next set of shlokas? So then we have... going to give up this clothes, you will definitely think of Ishwara. Right. So that's the so the whole chapter is now we look at how uh, Ishwara is, um, you know, becomes the main part of my life. So at the end of the day, we may have so many goals as part of my, you know, Vyavaharic life. But ultimately, all those goals have to dissolve into only this one goal. And that one goal is that Ishwara. So 
that is the uh, ultimate thing and this is what krishna is finally is also telling arjuna that the last question if you you know prayana kale chakatham nyeyusi niyatatmi bhi that's arjuna's question he says the only thing is with this but then we may ask this question how do i know when i will pass away you know should i think that you know i will pass away just now and i just bring everything i know that i have to focus on ishvara so i will uh, you know uh, j- just before i pass away i'll just think about narayana you know so you know the like the story uh, of this one uh, person who names all his sons narayana you know and uh, thinking that when he when he's going to pass away he will just chant narayana his son's name and he'll automatically get moksha you know but then at the end of his birth immediately he thinks about maybe the money that he's leaving behind and not really the name of narayana right so that is that's the danger that we might get into and uh, because i never know when i'm going to pass away but if i have to bring myself to think about narayana all the time what and how should i live my life that is uh, it almost has to be an habit i cannot expect that you know at the last moment i will concentrate the thing with with whom i am at frozen i think sunita she will join again i think i lost connection yeah. <laughs> right right I, i just connected back using my hotspot right okay, okay. Mm-hmm. but interestingly we are still live though wow. yeah that yeah that connection is still there you correct yeah so we were right here where we said that you know at the end of the day there could be many factors that could can prevent me from thinking you know of ishwaram it could be also not just my family and everyone but it could also be be my own um physical body you know if my body is in pain that is also going to prevent me from thinking about it right so i just never know towards the end of my life how i'm in what shape and form i'm going to be so i cannot afford to postpone this concentration on ishwaram until the time of my death you know maybe i'm i'm even lose my power of speaking 
maybe you know at that last minute of time there may be something outside that can happen you know like we say there are three ways adi daiva adi bhuta and adhyatma you know three ways in which disturbances can come to me you know so all these things can happen for which i have absolutely no control on thinking about it, thinking about that ishwara so i have to take this goal very seriously and i have to start that practice now itself so that i can actually think about or that thought of ishwar be totally part of myself so any um, any discussion on this point on how easy or difficult this can be what do you think so that is what you know he says antakale cha mameva smaran muktva kalevaram ya prayati samadbhavam yati nas yatra samshaya so krishna is just giving the final prescription you know he doesn't spend time on the fact that uh, we will have all these issues and all that he is just saying you just have to do this and it's up to us to analyze the shloka for uh, for ourselves and see where do i fit in in this whole thing you know so antakale cha mameva smaran kadevaram ya prayati so whoever departs he says you know whoever departs while thinking of me in my essential nature there is no possibility of return now again somebody may say you know what in my whole life in this particular life i didn't really get to uh, enjoy everything you know i really really wanted to maybe go to japan or something like that that didn't happen uh, i went to hawaii i went to all these places but japan no i did not go so you know can i just take birth just to go to japan now again that is not in our hands mainly because we don't know the kind of vasanas which is there within us you know so idea being that i uh, have to resolve these things in my mind in this birth itself and understand that what the ultimate goal is and of course i cannot do it mainly because the scriptures alone tell me that it is i have to start analyzing it and understanding it for myself why this goal is the most important one so then in shloka number 6 this is exactly what i just said because he says that you know ultimately whatever is in our interest whatever is in it that i have resolved within myself that is exactly where i will end up finally so i have to be very careful on what my last thought is but that last thought is driven by the fact that everything i have taken up to my life up to that point that is what my last thought will be so that last thought whatever i've been entertaining in my mind that much i should be careful you know how much of uh, say you know uh, jealousy i had towards somebody or how much of greed i had how much of anger how much of desire for more wealth more houses more uh, people in my life all these things i have to be very careful because ultimately that is the thought which will drive it and one very easy way to think about this uh, of ishwara at the end of the day is just i have just a simple example here it depends really upon the pattern of my thinking in all my life our pattern of thinking today has been where i have been separating things in the world you know in the world i always look at this person as somebody and that person as somebody and i um, basically distinguish them by their qualities or whatever they are by their strengths and weaknesses my likes and dislikes which i superimpose on the others so all these things is how i look at it so just like i have this example here of these this uh, you know in uh, in the ocean for example the water takes on different forms and shapes in the form of bubbles froth foam lather etc but at the end of the day it is nothing but water right so to can i look at this entire world 
as not those individual pieces, but as Ishwara in those forms. So it's just the mindset that I'm changing myself. You know, am I looking at the whole world as things and, oh, by the way, they are Ishwara, or am I looking at everything as Ishwara in the form of this, Ishwara in the form of bubble, Ishwara in the form of the ladder, etc. You know, so I have to change my mindset within myself to start looking at the world in this most universal way of life. So that is why that Yam Yam Bhavam is such an important uh, aspect here. So then in the next shloka, seventh one, we saw that he takes up this aspect on how to remember that Ishwara and perform our duties. But he starts off first with saying, whatever duty I have. And since in this particular shloka, he's referring to, he's talking to Arjuna, he uses the word fight because Arjuna is a fighter. He's a warrior. And uh, the shloka again, as I said last time, you know, is something which is most misunderstood where people have said that, oh, Bhagavad Gita teaches me how to fight. Bhagavad Gita tells me that I have to fight. That is not true. It all depends upon really whatever my duty is. So he says, Tatsma, therefore, Sarveshu Kaleshu, at all times, Maam Anusmara. Just remember me in whatever duty you're doing. In this case, he says, Yudhya, Mai Arpita Mano Buddhi. Just completely focus your mind into me, and then you will most definitely come to me. So, very powerful, very beautiful, very simple. Sadhana for all of us here. And what is that sadhana? Basically, the sadhana is really in and through everything I do, I just keep the goal of Ishwara. And that is why that uh, example that I gave of water and the bubbles, when I'm in front of the ocean, when I'm standing in the beach, I can just admire that beach for, you know, how the waves are coming up and everything. But in and through those waves, if, you, if I can just say it is just Ishwara, you know, just like I would say, it is nothing but water. Here, I have to think about that ultimately, that it is nothing but Ishwara. So, any questions or anything about so far? So far, so good. Okay. So, then now we come to some very um, beautiful key shlokas, you know, here, where he describes that Ishwara. And how does he describe that? First, you know, he talks about this aspect of uh, three things that is required here. So he says, Abhyasa yoga yuktena chetasa na anya gamina paramam purusham divyam yati partha anuchintaya. So, so he says three things. One is the only way one can think about that Ishwara in our own lives. Even as I am doing my duty, first of all is, you know, he talks about in the previous one, you know, with the mind and alert, mind and intellect completely in full alertness, you know. So I may be doing, say, my work, um, I'm talking to somebody. Even as I'm talking to somebody, I need to pay complete attention to what I'm speaking, right? So... It is developing that practice of alertness and developing the practice of focusing and concentration. So Abhyasa Yoga, which is constant practice of that alertness by the Chetasa, you know. So Chetasa, Cheta meaning the mind, where the mind is 100% focused and it is not wandering. So Na Anya Gamina, it is not uh, a wavering at all and it is completely focused on what you know with the mind not moving towards anything but the supreme resplendent purusha so here he gives the words beautifully the word purusha the word divyam you know all indicating that ishwara once when we do that then there is just no doubt that one can really reach that uh, that ultimate state of the purusha so so Anu Chintayan, so Anu Chintayan, basically Anu, anu means repeti repetition. So constantly I have to keep on uh, keep on remembering Ishvara in and through everything. It's not 
as if you know i do something and then okay i just keep repeating the word of narayan or ishwara or anything but in and through everything i have to uh, start thinking about ishwara through that aspect so 20 it's almost like a 24 hour meditation you know if i do this i don't necessarily have to sit for 30 minutes and then come back and do the normal things so you see the med- word meditation self is now taking a totally different route a totally different meaning here so he's you know basically the idea is that one has to develop a thought habit where the thought basically is i am just focusing 100% on what i'm doing so just that alone you can see how in today's world it is so difficult right especially with this phone that we have you know at uh, even for a few minutes we automatically think oh you know what anyway the lecture is for one hour i can just focus on something else L- let me take care of uh, this one quick text or this one quick uh, you know uh, this ping that comes through you know let me just check that out our mind is so habituated towards doing that but this probably the shloka is um, i i think i need to next time when i talk to some youth i should bring this as how in bhagavad gita it talks about how to manage your distractions you know so just focusing because it has all the words that it says here don't take your mind away to anything else focus your attention only on what you're doing and then of course he gives us also where to focus on and how to focus everything is there in this one shloka here so then now we are going to discuss this two shlokas 9 and 10 but the way we are going to do it is that first we will actually take the shloka 10 and then we'll come to 9 here because in shloka number 9 there is a lot of very good descriptions which will also allow our mind to focus on that divya purusha you know what who is the divya purusha what are the qualities of the divya purusha you know it's like we talked about before our mind tends to go only where there is a, a form there is a word that describes it otherwise it's impossible for us to think of anything again going back to the same example of this ocean and the water uh i can think about bubbles i can think about all this but it's hard for me to focus on just the water when i'm in front of an ocean so to here uh you know krishna is giving such beautiful words to explain that divya purusha which we will come to which is the shloka here but let's first address um the shloka number 10 here so in shloka number 10 he basically talks about this constant practice of this meditation and that meditation is just really focusing upon what i'm doing completely that concentration when i do that then the uh, uh, you know we, i can definitely reach there and what is he saying here he says prayana kale manasa achalena so at the time of death prayana kale manasa achalena with a mind that is completely unshaken okay bhaktya yukto yoga balena cha so completely with you know uh, first of course he has talked about shraddha now he talks about how that devotion element has to come into me so bhaktya through bhakti let me yoke myself let me just completely attach myself by the power of yoga alone by this power of constant practice that yoga bala bruvor madhye prayan pranam avishya samyak so in the middle of the two bros having placed the whole prana so we will discuss this also which is basically it uh, essentially what he is trying to say is it doesn't that doesn't mean that you know i just close my eyes and i focus my attention there but the whole idea is here the word prana indicates all the five uh, all the five powers of prana you know all this prana apana vyana samana udana all the powers of digestion all the powers of thinking all the powers everything 
essentially stops. Stops indicate, indicating not that it stops by itself, but it is something where the focus of myself is taken away from these pranas and the mind and intellect is just focused on that absolute self, which I'm saying is in between the two, uh, you know, Gruod Madhi, between the two eyebrows. So it's fixed on that supreme reality, which is that, and such a person goes to that resplendent Purusha. So basically all this can happen only, of course, when somebody has been practicing this all the time, you know, so that is, one develops that strength, that yoga balam, you know, that balam is uh, obtained only when this practice happens all the time. So that is what he's trying to say here. Now let's go back to shloka number 10 here and really see what each one of these words are really trying to tell us, you know. So it is basically, of course, in shloka 9, he gives you that jnani's sadhana here, which is kavin purana anushasitaram anoraniyam anoraniyam sam, samanusmaret yaha, sam yaha. That person who actually remembers uh, throughout Sarvasya Dhataram. So again, beautiful adjectives all for describing that Purusha. Sarvasya Dhataram, Achintya Rupam, Aditya Varnam. So you see how many beautiful words that he gives so that our focus of Ishwara remains on this description of Ishwara. And then tamasaha parastat, somebody who is beyond the darkness of ignorance. And here, of course, uh, what is he talking about ignorance? Um, what do you think? Any idea on what does he mean by the ignorance? We, of course, come to describing each one of these words. That's why I wanted to spend a little time today just going through each one of each one of the words of that. Supreme Purusha or the Paramatma, you know. So let's take the word Kavi itself. So what does the word Kavi come to your mind when we think about this word Kavi? The writer or the, the writer, poet. Exactly, poet. a poet, exactly. But here the word Kavi, you know, is... Referring to like, you know, uh, the Kranta Darshi, you know, that's such a person who in this, like, you know, who's omniscient, who's all knowing. So that is the meaning of Kavi here. So Kavi is that person who, who knows everything, who is, the nothing can be hidden from this person. So he's actually beyond the, uh, our own thing aspect of, you know, time and space. So, which means that he knows everything which was the past, present, and future. So, that is the word Kavi. So, Kavi means omniscient, all-knowing, somebody who is beyond the concept of time and space. And that is the reference for uh, here, which is, um, you know, Kavi. So, you know, we've come across some other words in the past too, in the second chapter, Vedaham Samatitani, Vartamani, Cha Arjuna. Bhavishyani, Chabutani, you know. So that is what this word Kavi actually means. So we can we can connect it to that second chapter. So once, so if I meditate upon even just this word Kavi, you know, somebody who is beyond time, somebody who is this one, you can see how the mind just totally stills. Because... You cannot think of anything which is beyond time and space. Now, suppose I say, you know, let me uh, meditate upon a flower. If when I meditate on a flower, automatically, you know, the thought will come, okay, is this a manipu or is it a rose? Is it pink in color? Is it white in color? Does it have a beautiful, um, you know, aroma? All that. But the word kavi here, which is beyond time, beyond space, which is omniscient, which is all-knowing, automatically my mind just stills. So that is why this word has been chosen here beautifully to describe that supreme Paramatma. The next word, which is Puranam. 
so what is the word puranam you know what word what do you, what does it ring what does it you know what is what kind of meaning does it come to you old old yeah exactly old or ancient right so here actually he is saying puranam means puranam actually maybe i should put another a here puranam which means it is timeless it is timeless so uh, shankaracharya ji in his bhashya he says pura eva navah api you know pura api navah which means that it it may seem ancient but it is always new it is uh, so generally when we say older new we just refer to it with respect to time right but then as i said the word kavi which means beyond time so here you know basically purana means that which is again which is uh, it may seem ancient but it is always new and in uh, some of us who have done drik drish vivek you know in that the shloka number 5 no deti nasta metesha swayam prakasha which is neither born which is neither dies it is always self illumining it is that chaitanya purana which is always always fresh always it is beyond the concept of time it is always new and that is what this word purana means okay the next word anushasi taram anushasi taram which means that one who controls everything one who has a final authority over everything that is an anushasitaram so this uh, paramatma uh, is or ishvara is ultimately the one who uh, is the controller of everything and today you know we give so much of importance to our own bosses you know we want to please the boss we want to make sure that you know we don't upset the boss because we think our boss is the controller of my destiny but here we have that paramatma who is an even bigger controller you know who is a much bigger authority over everything the next one which is sarvasya dhataram sarvasya dhataram dhataram means one who uh, ordains everything i guess in some ways it's very similar to the other word but it's also here where he is not just a controller but he is the person he or she or it how we we want to look at this ishwara is the one which basically um, distributes everything according to one's actions so we can say that that ishwara is really the set of all the laws put together ishwara is that dharma principle you know which keeps everything together so ishwara is that also the substratum just like i gave this uh, again i'm bringing this ocean and wave i think i'm talking about ocean and wave and bubbles quite a bit in this uh, lecture here but really because we are talking about that absolute paramatma brahman the closest example we can think about is actually this ocean and the waves where in this ocean that ultimate substratum is nothing but that water that water which comes in the form of uh, the waves and everything so to the ultimate substratum in this whole world at the end of the day is nothing but that ishvara that ishvara which is in the form of everything that ishvara which maintains that order which is there that ishvara which uh, individually each one of us whatever kind of good or not so good things we do the result of which we get is really the composite effect of this particular ishvara so sarvasya dhataram the next one which is anoraniya anoraniya which is uh, you know uh, in chemistry the smallest particle that we can think of is you know the atoms you know atoms of course you have all the other things like the quarks and all this so it's smaller or subtler than the smallest thing that i can think of that is uh, you know something that uh, i mean i can keep breaking apart to a point where 
I cannot even see it. And he's saying that, you know, at the end of the day, um, this uh, principle, this consciousness principle is so small that it, you, whatever you do, you cannot see by the most powerful of all the microscopes that can be invented. Okay. So it is that sukshma. It is so sukshma, even the mind cannot even comprehend that part of it. So and to that extent is, you know, it can be that small or big as we may think about it. And then it is achinti rupam. Achinti rupam meaning that I cannot give any kind of rupam to it. I can use all these rupams, all these definitions for my own meditation. But at the end of the day, give any kind of form, it is, I can tell you it is without any form. So it's almost like you know, Samarth Ramdas, who was the teacher for Shivaji, you know, Chatrapati Shivaji. He used to say, how, you know, if you want to know how to meditate upon this Paramatma, so you have to meditate upon this without even without becoming a thinker. You know, so think of that which is totally unthinkable. That is meditation. So without being a thinker, I think of that which cannot be thought of. So that is Achinti Rupam. So that, uh, in fact, in Isha Vasya Upanishad, there is um, uh, this beautiful thing which says, you know, where yato vacho nivartante. That is, the words, they go and they come back because you just cannot even describe this aspect of Paramatma. It is that powerful. So think about you know, how can we even think of nothing. So that is Achintya Rupam. So Paramatma is that Achintya Rupam. And then Aditya Varnam. So you know, he describes that as much as I can try to comprehend that brilliance of the sun, I just cannot even do it. So it is that so he's symbolically comparing Ishvara to that Aditya or the sun god. You know, so I should try to contemplate on that Ishvara throughout in such a way that you know, uh, as as I would contemplate on the brilliance of the sun. So just like we have one sun which illumines everything, that Paramatma is a principle because of which we are conscious of everything else. You know, so just like the whole place when it gets lighted is because of that one sun. So to everything that comes into life is because of that, uh, that consciousness itself. So that is Aditya Varna. And then next one, Tamasa Parastat. That which is unaffected by even darkness. So you, I just put this picture of the sun here where everything is so dark, you know, but still the sun is totally unaffected. So tamasaparasa, that which is unaffected by darkness. So that is the difference between, you know, the sunlight and the Atma Jyoti. So the sun, sunlight can actually illumine everything except one thing it cannot illumine is darkness, right? But this uh, Paramatma, this consciousness, which is nothing but Atma Jyoti compared to the Aditya Jyoti, that can illumine even darkness. So we know that, you know, for example, when I go to sleep, um, when I'm awake, I am aware of life, right? When I'm dreaming, that too, you know, I can be aware that because of the consciousness, I'm able to dream. But when I'm sleeping, I'm actually not conscious of anything at all. But does that mean that there is no consciousness around? No, that is not true. That consciousness is still there. That Atma Jyoti is still there. And uh, here I want to give this beautiful uh, example of you know, Swami Chinmananda. He would say, he, uh, he, he gives a story, you know, somebody went and told Sun God, you know, um, did you know that there is this beautiful girl her name is Miss Darkness. So 
you can, you know, why don't you try to meet uh, this uh, Miss Darkness and try to marry her? So the sun started running, it seems. You know, the sun started running after this Miss Darkness and just could not, you know, he kept on chasing, but he could never catch her because, and maybe that is why to this day, the sun is going round and wrong, around, and that is why the sun is still really a bachelor, you know, because he can just not, you know, catch that darkness itself. So, but then, you know, like I said, the Atma Jyoti is something that is there even when there is darkness also. So, but it is beyond even Tamasaha, Tamasaha indicating that darkness of ignorance. Ignorance is again a word that we use in our uh, spiritual literature to indicate uh, this aspect of this I-ness about me. You know, every time when I say I, I refer to this I as this one with the physical body and everything. But that absolute I is formless, is without any uh, attributes. It's beyond the body, mind and intellect. But I, in my ignorance, always call myself this I, which is with body. That is the ignorance that he's saying. And so this Atma is even beyond that ignorance. So Tamasaha Parastat, Parastat, you know, which is even beyond that. So that is the thing. So any questions, any thoughts here? So Kaving Puryam, Kaving Puranam Anushasitaram Anodaniyam Anusmaredhyah Sarvasya Dhataram Achintya Rupam Aditya Varanam Tamasap Parasat. Such a beautiful, again, another shloka for meditation, right? Where so many different meanings is given. Again, Kaving meaning that which is, you know, timeless. Puranam, which is always fresh. Anusha Sitaram. Anoraniyam, small. Then uh, I have to always remember Sarvasya Dhataram, again, someone who ordains everything. Achintya Rupam. Uh, which is um, smaller than the smallest, subtlest, the absolute subtlest, which again, um, in the Western, you know, in our, the way we study, if you look at it just from a purely materialistic point of view, we would say, what is there? You know, only what my eyes can see, I can believe it. But this is even beyond the aspect of eyes. Aditya Varnam, which is indicating the... Um, um, a form of, it's the brilliance, comparing to the brilliance of the sun, and tamas of parasat, which is beyond darkness. Any questions, any thoughts here? Uh, yeah, I forgot to say Anusha Sitaram, which is one who controls everything, who has a final authority over everything. So that is almost the shlokas 8 to 10. And then uh, we saw the shloka number 10. So where... So when I have this concept of Paramatma and through constant practice, I develop that balam, you know, that strength. And with that strength, when I focus my complete attention, bruvod madhye, prana aveshya samyak, prana aveshya samyak, where I have... Uh, you know, where there is complete cessation in some sense uh, on the pranas, satam param purusham upaiti divyam. So I can, fixing this one, he goes to that resplendent purusha. So next week, we'll take the shloka or shloka number 11, where, you know, he talks about the uh, meditation upon the name of Ishvara. So we'll talk a little bit about also the two kinds of moksha, the krama mukti and the, um, you know, um, the krama mukti, which happens by focusing on Ishvara and the moksha, which is obtained on going to that nirguna state. Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha, sarve santu niramayaha, sarve bhatrani pashyantu. Ma kasya tukha bhagavad Om shanti shanti shantihi Om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnamutachyate
ಪೂರ್ಣಸ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಾದಾಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮೇವಾವಶಿಷ್ಯತೆ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಓಂ Hadi yo everyone any questions so hadi yo